Good morning. I know you're sad because soon enough you won't be seeing me three days a week. But you have to find the courage to go on, right? I'm going to continue with the analysis of select relevant passages from chapters 19 and on, which is something I intend to continue until we reach the conclusion of the prince. I put on the screen the notes that were on the board last week because some of this is to be found once more, especially in chapters 19 and 20 and here and there in the following chapters as well. That is to say that we see in the style of Machiavelli that Machiavelli will refuse to commit to assigning a positive or a negative value to words, labels, ideas, because it all depends on the context. Not only that, but he will also add exceptions to any kind of situation where he has committed to a position, but then exceptions are also found or exceptions are allowed for one particular kind of leader, especially, which is the new leader. Because after all, Machiavelli <coughs> has in mind <coughs> for the prince also, among others, the goal of providing a quick solution to the political and military crisis of his time. There will be a lot of insistence on the complex relationship between love and fear. Fear, of course, you can rely on because fear depends on, it's fear of punishment for Machiavelli, so it depends on the possible use of force, but then love is also required. Love that is obtained through influence by taking care of your appearances, by projecting an image that will generate confidence in the citizens, whereby the citizens will, at least part of the time, engage in a collaborative behavior, in a cooperative behavior, conforming to, complying with the directives of the government voluntarily. And the third element for this relationship is, of course, hatred which is what fear turns into if it is abused. And there, over and over again, we will find Machiavelli insisting that the primary cause of hatred in the general population, in the populace, is the attempt by the leader to get the property or the women of the citizens, which has to do in a rudimentary way with the boundaries between public and private that Machiavelli is trying to set and imagine. And it is important to consider how, even though Machiavelli's leader is in many ways a dictatorial leader with uh, boundless amounts of power, there are in fact some hard boundaries that even a leader who is operating in a context that is not democratic at all cannot trespass. When it comes to the relationship within, between force and, violence, and, and, and influence, there too you see a complex dynamic because clearly Machiavelli seems to prefer the use of force because it is reliable, but then when it comes to giving actual examples, Machiavelli will not, especially in the last part of The Prince, provide a lot of examples of the use of force, of fights, of wars. Yet, over and over again, he will provide examples with enough influence in the hands of the leader that wars, fights, can actually be avoided altogether because being uh, uh, protected with the correct kind of force, which is not mercenary soldiers, but a, an army 
of armed citizen and being supported by citizens who believe the, their leader to be just, to be honest, enemies internal and external are deterred and will more often than not give up on the idea of attacking altogether the external enemies or conspiring against the leader, the internal enemies. I'm going to continue using the PDF document that I posted last week and I posted the link once more under week 14. This is where we stopped last week on avoiding contempt and hatred, chapter 19. What's interesting about this passage is not simply the repetition of the saying, right? The leader should avoid a situation that will make, or behaviors that will make him hateful and contemptible. And this is one of the primary responsibilities of a good leader. What's more interesting is this point highlighted in green at the bottom of the screen right here. In the other infamies, he will find no peril at all. Meaning that there are some hard boundaries for the leader, but they're limited. And the implication here is that the leader will not be perfect. However, the leader has to exercise self-control only when it comes to immoral, amoral, dishonest behaviors that will impact negatively on their leadership. Keep this in mind because, of course, there are two different schools of thought throughout time. For example, if you go back to the Romans, you find that the Romans, much more than the Greeks, insisted on presented portraits of some of the most well-known leaders of the Roman Republic, especially, as paradoxical examples of leadership. People who, in public life, used and demonstrated great skills, however, who at the same time in their private lives had vices, had shortcomings, were not perfect at all, but the accounts of those leaders, the realistic accounts of those leaders, keeping into consideration, offering the reader this mixed view of good and bad, did not worry about rendering a negative judgment because they were able to separate the positive impact of the leaderships of these people, of these individuals on public life from their minor shortcomings. This will change in Roman historiography with the empire because then the emperors will more often than not offer more vices than virtues to the point where you find famous historians such as Tacitus ignoring altogether what, for example, Emperor Nero might have done that was positive to offer only their negative sides and to emphasize mostly their private personal vices implying that those vices would affect the government, which of course was not the case because by the time of the empire, the empire itself, the administration of the empire was a complex apparatus that did not rely solely on the decisions of the emperors. But those Roman historians who told us the stories of the emperors and the stories of the decadence of the empire belong mostly to the conservative elites in Rome who felt, especially during the first century, 
a deep nostalgia for the values of the Republic, exaggerating the virtues of Romans, of ancient Romans before the empire, exaggerating the faults of the Roman emperors, especially the first 10 or 15. And, and, and it seems like they were all loonies, complete crooks and, and out of their mind, right? And some of them have entered the lore about the decadence of the Roman Empire. And then that view, of course, was reinforced by a Christian view of history, where, whereby a sinner cannot be a positive, uh, cannot have a positive effect on society. Once again, what is the first thing to avoid hatred, not to be rapacious and usurper of property and women of his subject. Again, keep in mind this as a crude reference to the separation between public and private, meaning that there is a private context for the citizens where they can and will exercise their leadership and you cannot enter into competition there because there is no advantage for the leader and uh, even victory there does not produce a positive outcome for society in general. When it comes to the reference to ambition and the few Machiavelli has in mind, the fact that some of the citizens will have enough skills, especially the few wealthy, influential citizens, the wealthy or the aristocrats, to mount some kind of resistance and to attempt to take power away from the leader. And Machiavelli often makes this into a game of numbers, right? As long as you satisfy the majority of the citizens, then the few with limited support will not be strong enough to mount a serious attack and take the government from you. The next here in yellow is one in a short series of statements where Machiavelli takes a position that is not entirely logical, justified, and reasoned. It's one of those passages that are especially common in the last, ch in the last chapters of The Prince, where Machiavelli, instead of examining what the mindset or the attitudes that are positive for leadership should be based on context, takes a position this time. And the position is in favor of activity, of engagement, of facing the issues head on without any hesitation. Because this is part of the overall reflection by Machiavelli about the crisis that Florence and the other Italian states are facing during this period. A crisis that might not find the right solution, the perfect solution, or even the perfect leadership to address the issue. However, an attempt must be made to resolve it. And if you have on one side some imperfect, incomplete solution, some imperfect leader, and on the other side you have inactivity, not doing anything, waiting for the right leader, waiting for the right solution, Machiavelli takes the position that even the wrong solution is better than just waiting or hesitating. And the kind of leader that Machiavelli has in mind for Italy during that time, within the context of a crisis that sees the involvement of foreign countries, sees the disagreement among the Italian states that should react to those invasions by foreign armies, in this context, Machiavelli 
would like to have a warrior as a leader. Someone who doesn't wait before the crisis has no solution whatsoever, right? Time is of the essence, and therefore you need someone who will go to task, will go to war about this. That's why in reference to contempt derived from the image projected by the leader, Machiavelli will say that it makes the leader contemptible if he is believed to be changeable, light, effeminate, pusillanimous, irresolute. Which means the contrary of what a warrior should be. And notice that Machiavelli takes a position when in fact throughout the book, and especially in some of the last chapters, he has oscillated to the point where, for example, in the case of Scipio and Hannibal, he depicted Hannibal as a cruel leader of the army, of the Carthaginian army, Scipio as a compassionate leader, a paternal leader of the Roman army, and said both were successful to a degree. So, in a case such as that, Machiavelli refuses to take position about what the qualities of a leader should be. In here, and a few other passages, he does. He does take a position. He does attach a negative value to this. However, keep in mind the background. The background, the idea that is in the back of Machiavelli's mind when he's writing these chapters, which came more probably after 1515, Machiavelli began to write the, the prince around 1512, but continued to make changes and to expand the book until probably 1517 or even 1518. Then the book was not published by him and was circulated in a manuscript format and then published after his death, but especially during those years, it becomes clear that there can hardly be a good resolution to the crisis of Italy, hence the emphasis on being active, on taking action, okay? And this is to be seen as the opposite of taking action, okay? Notice also that what can, the, the wording, the exact wording by Machiavelli in this passage, the, the leader should contrive that in his actions are recognized greatness, spiritedness, weightness, and strength. Where contrive tells you that maybe the leader doesn't have really all of these qualities or doesn't fully possess those qualities, but you have to work and make it so make it that they appear to be your qualities as a leader, and then take note of the use of the word recognized. It doesn't matter if you have those qualities and people don't identify those as your qualities as a leader, meaning that the image is everything. And without that, you may have those skills, but they will not produce a positive effect. So you have to work on your image, right? And this makes Machiavelli for uh, the thinker that thought of a modern kind of leadership, right? This insistence on image. And, and again, you don't have to agree with everything else that Machiavelli has to say, but we do have a, an even better understanding in this kind of society of the relevance that the image of political leaders has, right, in, in their career, in their success. I like this passage in green because it makes me think of Don Vito Corleone <laughs> or other mafia leaders, right? With regard to private dealings, meaning when the prince is with a single citizen, so not in a public forum addressing social issues, but when citizens, as they would do during the time, go to the prince saying, I have this situation, I need your help, 
uh, you need to restore justice, etc. So think of Bonacera, uh, the, the, the man in the first scene who comes to uh, Don Corleone to have justice for his daughter with regards to private dealings among his subjects. He should want his pronouncement to be irrevocable, right? Has to be seen as the sources of justice and also as someone who can be persuaded by a citizen to intervene, but that control has to be limited. So you cannot go to the leader twice to ask for a favor, because otherwise the balance of power and control leans too much on the side of the subject. It must be clear that the power is with the leader. Exceptions can be granted. Favors can be made to the citizen, but those are exceptional circumstances, right? So no changing of your mind. Even if your pronouncement is wrong, that has to be it. You have to protect your reputation and certainly that seems to be the mindset of Don Corleone and similar characters in those films. So the prince who creates this opinion of himself is very well regarded, but this means, of course, we understand that this prince will have influence over their citizens, and therefore it's all a matter of power. Because Having a good image is one of the forms, the best forms of deterrence. Against anyone who is well regarded, it is difficult to conspire. This is a reference to the internal enemies. So anyone within the states who would like to take the power from the prince, they see they have a lot of influence and therefore they're not going just against this one individual. They're going against a large section of their society. And with difficulty is he attacked. So that is possible, but the result will probably be in his favor so long as it is understood that he is excellent and revered by the people. Excellent means the leader has skills. The leader can defend himself. Revered by his own people, it means they have the support of the citizens, so the citizens would rather support the leader than the conspirators, and will not, the, whoever, whoever wants to conspire against the government will not find, easily find supporters within society. That is made even clearer in the next passage. The prince must have two fears, there are two threats, two things that can affect his power, one is an internal attack by the subjects. The other is an external attack by outside powers, by outside enemies. So internal enemies, external enemies. And what kind of response do you expect to find? You might expect to find in and a justifiable insistence on the availability of force to defend against those attacks. When in fact, Machiavelli here gives a lot of attention to influence, primarily to influence. So when it comes to external enemies, Machiavelli says the leader is defended by good arms, force, good allies, which is part of a diplomatic network, so a form of influence. He adds that if the leader has good arms, then people will want to be his friends, right? Because they want to avoid being attacked. But there is no reference whatsoever to a, an actual war and how the leader should engage in that kind of war whenever necessary. Machiavelli goes right away to multiplying the examples of the use of influence. Internal matters, internal enemies, will always stand firm when external ones stand firm. Which is an indirect way of saying that if you prov provide security at the borders, right, if you can defend the state from external enemies, 
then the stability that is established within the order that is established within the state will be beneficial to the citizens and the citizens will support you. Of course, this is a conservative view, right? No, no doubt about that. We're just trying to understand what the prince has to say, unless they have already been disturbed by a conspiracy. But again, he just said that there shouldn't be any conspiracy if you take care of your reputation and of your image. How you defend from a conspiracy by, once again, avoiding being hated and despised and keeping the people satisfied with the leadership. So you defend with influence. It doesn't say you defend by going after the conspirators, using force, using jail, using torture. No, that is not even necessary. One of the most powerful remedies a prince has against conspiracies is not to be hated by his own people, meaning to have influence over their people. Because <clears throat> then <clears throat> the conspirators will be afraid, not just or the leader will be afraid of the other citizens. And that is explained in the following passages. Notice this reference to the psychology of the players involved, which is also a kind of modern consideration. On, on the side of the conspirator, there is only fear, apprehension, and worry about a punishment that frightens him, okay? So the conspirator has a lot of uncertainty. The outcome is not predictable at all. They have to have a lot of support that doesn't seem to be there in society because most people support the leader and they don't have a lot of force because their numbers are small, etc. On the side of the prince, there is the majesty of the principality, meaning the very fact that they occupy the position of leadership implies that there is respect and support for the leader, but also general respect and support for the position itself, for the institution itself, right? It may seem to be easy to go against Biden as a frail old man, but Biden is still the president and the presidency carries a lot of power and garners a lot of respect by itself as an institution, right? Just to make a silly example. When popular benevolence is added to all these things, meaning when people engage in a collaborative game with the government, with the leadership, it is impossible that anyone should be so foolhardy as to conspire. In, on page 98, at the end of, of page 14 of the PDF, Machiavelli goes back to the usual ambivalence, refusing to commit about the positive and negative value of what the leader does. So even when it comes to hatred, whether you're good or bad, whether you're good or evil, you might, you, you might get some hatred. And once again, Sometimes, depending on the context, you have to be evil. <coughs> In fact, Machiavelli goes on to give them a paradoxical example of a situation where the context would force the leader not to be honest at all. When they are in charge of a community or a collectivity that is in itself corrupt, he might have been thinking about the Roman Empire, especially during the third century. During the third century there were a lot of Roman emperors, about 20 different Roman emperors in roughly 50 or 60 years because constantly they were being uh, replaced. So if you want to get the loyalty of the people or the soldier, 
the great would be the aristocracy, when they themselves are not particularly honest, you have to look like one of them. Right. At that point, good works are your enemies, where Machiavelli is playing with this paradox. Being good is exactly the thing that causes you to fail in that kind of situation. The same kind of ambivalence you find at the beginning of chapter 20 on the fortresses, where you see a series, a long series of examples of different kinds of practices in regards to the use of fortresses, some princes, some others, some have fed hatreds, some others have taken to winning over the persons, some have built fortresses, some have ruined <coughs> and destroyed those fortresses. But you see, Machiavelli is not committing to any of those positions, saying that it all depends on the context. And he says that in this passage highlighted in yellow, on all of these things, I cannot pass the definitive sentence without coming to the particulars of those states where any decision like this has to be made. Meaning, it all depends on the specifics of the context. So we cannot say that fortresses are good or bad, positive or negative in their effect on the leadership without examining the context, right? And here we understand how important the idea of a context-based examination of the validity of a strategy is for Machiavelli. Again, it's not about being relative in general, but everything has to be measured against a space and a time, a specific historical context. The same Machiavelli will do in reference to disarming citizens. Citizens have weapons, of course, you can expect in a city-state such as Florence people to have uh, the wealthier people to be armed. What do you do with them? And Machiavelli is once again hesitant, but he, he leans more in favor of keeping those arms with the citizens because we know that Machiavelli favors the use of armed citizens of a local army over the choice of auxiliary troops loaned by another country or mercenaries, okay? So, taking the arms from the citizens might seem logical. This is what Machiavelli implies. Because if you take the arms from them, then you should gain more power, more control. If you're the only one who uh, controls uh, armed forces in society. However, this would be evidence of mistrusting the citizens, and therefore you lose influence. And once again, force, influence, Machiavelli seems to favor the use of force because you can rely on the fear produced by it, but at the same time you cannot do anything without influence, and so it's always a balance. Not only it's always a balance, but as I said, you find so many examples about the correct use of force that any reference to force itself, to war, to fighting, dwarfs compared to the number of these passages. Right? Because then, if you don't want to arm your citizens, you have to rely on mercenaries. And Machiavelli has already said how negative it is and makes yet another reference to the fact that it's dangerous, that you can rely on mercenaries, then an exception is posited for a prince that acquires a new state. And this is more often than not a reference to any potential leader that will unify Italy and make Italy into a new state, a new nation, okay? Especially when you read the following sentence, a new state which, like a limb, is attached to his old state. Meaning that what Machiavelli has in mind is that Florence or Milan or Venice or Naples, one of the powerful players on the Italian political arena, will take the leadership 
expand their state and the unified new Italian nation will be partly new, partly old, because the leader will rely on the support of their original state, which will be incorporated into this new organism that is altogether new, but it's a mix of old and new. So in this case, Machiavelli says, it is necessary to deserve, disarm the citizens of that state because he understands the chaotic situation of Italy. If you want to conquer other states in Italy to create this unified nation, you cannot keep the territories that you've added to your state with arms. But it's not saying that all of the citizens should be disarmed because this kind of leader has a basis, which would be, again, the city of Florence or Venice or Naples or Milan. And locally, in their old state, they would find the support of armed local forces, which they can rely on. Whereas the others have been annexed, have been added to the new state, but you can rely on them entirely. At the end of this chapter, you find an interesting reference to fortune, which will then be the theme of famous chapter 25th, the next to last chapter of The Prince. So in order to show that you are great, in order to build an image of greatness, and also in order to train and develop your skills, the skills that nature has endowed the leader with, you need some trouble, you need some issues, you need some problems to address. And this is a constant. Machiavelli has this kind of leadership in mind, a leadership that is made to address a goal, not for a time of peace, not for building society, but for fixing society, right? That's why he starts by saying, princes become great when they overcome the difficulties and the opposing forces that <coughs> face them. Right? Without an issue, there is no Machiavellian leadership. That's basically the thing. Then he says, well, fortune will take care of that, right? The circumstances will offer you some kind of, um, of, of crisis to show your greatness and therefore scaffold your image and your reputation. And at the end it says, well, in case fortune doesn't offer you any such issue, you can build one yourself. You can go to war when it is not necessary to have a war. And unfortunately, especially during the 20th century, we have plenty of examples, some in the 21st as well, right? Of wars that were devised as an instrument to support a leadership that was failing or fizzling, right? When the impression was that the war could easily be won and the, the resulting positive effects would strengthen the image of the leadership, right? You can easily think of current examples. Many judge that a wise prince, when he has the opportunity, must cleverly nourish some enmity. Cleverly, because you cannot be seen. You cannot be understood as the one who's provoking this war. You still have to take care of your image. You have to simulate and dissimulate. So that when it is defeated, when you win the war, his greatness comes out increased. So you don't need to go to war, but you do for the image. And once again, you see force and influence. And influence uh, is uh, the most important aspect, right? Uh, this is what even the use of force has to produce. The conclusion of the chapter reflects the same ambivalence we found at the beginning. Fortresses are useful or not, according to the times, according to the context. And then, as I specified in my general introduction, as a final confirmation of the relevance of the theme of influence in here, Machiavelli will say, if you're afraid of your enemies, you don't need fortresses, 
actually if you have enough influence over your citizens, if you're supported by them. However, if you're afraid of your citizens, then you should have fortresses within the state. So it's a reversal of what you might have expected based on previous treatises. Fortresses are more useful to defend against your own citizens than to defend against enemies or fortifications. Is this also a hidden reflection by Machiavelli about the failure of fortresses during a time when artillery was introduced and was shown to be, was demonstrated to be very efficacious, very uh, effective against fortresses, maybe, but Machiavelli doesn't talk much about the latest technologies available to modern armies. You see, the best fortress there is is not to be hated by the people, where Machiavelli takes something very material, fortification, replaces it with something very immaterial, influence over your citizens, and makes influence more powerful than the material fortification, even though you might have thought fortifications is something you control, right? So you can safely rely on them, and instead Machiavelli goes the opposite way. If the people hold you in hatred, the fortresses do not save you. Okay, so this is another hard boundary for the leader. No matter how much force you have, if you have no influence, you will fail eventually. And I, I will continue with highlights from my Kindle version of the textbook with the same pagination as the textbook that you have. This is the end of the last chapter. It's so sensitive. Let me sit down and see. So we have another chapter here with chapter 21 about taking care of appearances, projecting an image that will reinforce your leadership. The title is formulated in this way, what the prince should be to be thought outstanding, where again, it doesn't matter if you are or you're not. If you are and people don't acknowledge that, then you have very little influence. If you are not outstanding, there, there's more reason there to create a public image, to reinforce, uh, the, to, to compensate for the skills that you don't really have. Okay. See? And that's why Machiavelli, in a very modern fashion, talks about public secular ceremonies, rituals of society where leaders are being seen with the citizens in a context where they seem to be rewarding the good merits of the citizens. So, for example, in here he says it also helps a prince very much to give rare examples of himself concerning internal government, where rare means strategic. Because if you do it all the time, then you devalue that kind of practice. So you have to be strategic about being seen in public. You have to build and potentiate the effects of your apparitions in public and makes reference to one of the leaders of Milan in the 14th century, when the opportunity occurs of someone who does something extraordinary in civil life. This is a constant in modern governments, modern meaning from the early modern era on, to create the impression that 
your society is a kind of meritocracy where good behavior is reinforced and rewarded, right? Because by rewarding select citizens, you give the impression that anyone can gain that kind of recognition, which is never the case, right? Virtually every case of meritocracy is just the theater of merit, not the recognition of merit wherever it is in society. And that is why some of the 20th century totalitarian governments on both sides of the political spectrum uh, used reward strategically, both the governments of fascist Italy, the government of Germany during National Socialism, but also the government of the Soviet Union had these public rituals where the best workers, the best fighters, soldiers, heroes of the fatherland were being awarded to give the example to set the example for all the other citizens, to instruct the other citizens that that kind of collaborative, supportive behavior would be recognized. And it was always strategic, never systematic recognition, right? To choose a manner to reward or punish, because Machiavelli also believed in public execution as an example as a public ritual, and he was not the only one. It was widely used as a system until the 18th century. That will be very much talked about. You want to have as much coverage of this as possible, right? And Machiavelli in this case is talking about word of mouth, which would have happened in a relatively small uh, town such as Florence or, or Venice. We're talking about uh, less than 200,000 people. Above all, a prince must contrive in each of his actions to give himself the fame of a great man and of an excellent intelligence, which is, once again, an, an invitation to work on your public image. Then Machiavelli goes back again to the theme that we found before of leadership that must be firm leadership without hesitation. A prince is also esteemed when he is a true friend and a true enemy. That is when, without any hesitation, he reveals himself in favor of one person and against another. Such decisiveness will always be useful than staying neutral. And again, keep in mind the situation in Italy and Machiavelli, who's saying, above all, take action, do something. And if you take a decision, it doesn't matter, uh, uh, carry on with it. Try to get to the end of your strategies. Try to find a solution. Chapter 22 in some ways is close to what Machiavelli used to do for a career, because when they're talking about secret matters, that would be secreta in Latin, and secreta is the base word of secretary. Machiavelli himself worked as a secretary for the government of the Republic of Florence for more than a dozen years during the adult part of his life, right? So you may think that Machiavelli in this short chapter is giving out hints to powerful readers of this book, especially the Medicis, that he knows something about being the secretary, about dealing with internal matters or being the advisor to other leaders. In fact, Machiavelli seems almost to contradict himself because in this paragraph, the second paragraph of this chapter that I highlighted in pink, uh, Machiavelli talks about leaders who don't really have the skills, the primary skills that are necessary, that are required in a leader. Because until this point, really, Machiavelli has given the impression to a fault 
that the leader has to do everything by himself, right? That the operation of the government relies mostly on the prince. In here, he's giving an example of a leader who gives a good demonstration of their skills by picking the right ministers, by picking the right collaborators. And Machiavelli even suggests that if you lack yourself some skills, then you can compensate for that by picking people around you who have those skills. The only way to remove this apparent contradiction is to combine this passage with the conclusion of chapter 7 about the failure of Cesare Borgia, who by himself decided who should be the next pope, made the wrong decision, supported the wrong cardinal, who became Pope as Julius II, and had Cesare Borgia arrested, jailed, and then eventually shipped out from Italy to Spain, where in a matter of a few years, Cesare Borgia will be killed in a skirmish and uh, finish his career in a miserable way. It only makes sense if you think that Machiavelli is giving an indirect suggestion applicable to the case of Cesare Borgia, who had the primary skills that are required in a good leader, lacked some of the skills that became necessary when the context changed around him, and he could have benefited from having a secretary, such as Machiavelli, to fill the gaps, provide the right strategy for a changed environment. Okay. Chapter 23 is also interesting and, and very mafia-like, right? And it's, it's very clever. It's brilliantly written, even though the point is quite minor. Machiavelli is saying you should not have people around you that are flattering you, right? That are praising you and not telling you what you're doing wrong. At the same time, Machiavelli says, the opposite would be harmful because you have to communicate to the people around you that they can be direct and honest about the faults in your leadership, but they cannot do that all the time. Or not everyone can do that around you because otherwise your reputation is tarnished, is impacted in a negative way. If you're the kind of leader that everyone will lie to, and in modern times this has been studied also in reference to the leadership of commercial companies with the concept of the cocoon, the fact that the leaders of great tech companies live surrounded by yes-men or live surrounded by people who will only give you positive information, but at this point the same can certainly be said of Putin. For sure, Putin was fed inaccurate information about the kind of resistance he would find in Ukraine or how difficult the war would have been. If that's the case, you will fail. At the same time, if anyone can approach you freely and tells you, that's wrong, what you're doing is wrong, and they have no fear, then you have no reputation, you have no power. So even in regards to this, you have to be very selective. You have to have a select few who can be honest with you. The others can even flatter you because it means that they have so much fear that they feel compelled to show respect to you at all times.